Welcome to this session on exploratory data analysis. What are the goals of exploratory data analysis? So we want to analyze a specific data set. That is to answer questions using data visualization and statistical methods. And we're going to use that information to build machine learning systems that make predictions about the future. As a starting point, I want to talk a bit about the specifics of learning from data, because that's what we're doing with machine learning. I would like you to pause this video and then look at the picture on the left and the picture on the right and decide which one you think is random and which is not. Now, this one is actually the data that is randomly distributed, whereas this one is not randomly distributed. Nevertheless, a lot of people think the one on the right is much rather to be random because all these points are neatly spaced from each other, whereas on the left we have these weird clusters. So that's a bit against our intuition about randomness, but that's really what randomness is, right? We can't really predict where things go. We don't actually always have these nice patterns in random data. But this problem, the lack of intuitive grasp that we have about statistics, actually is really dangerous considering machine learning. There is a phenomenon called spurious correlations. In Germany, we would say Scheinkorrelation. And that's a relationship between different data points that are mathematically connected to each other. So if we do the math, it actually looks like there is a relationship, but in fact, there is no causal relationship. There's no real relationship between one and the other. One is not causing the other. And one example that we have here is the total number of people who die on the US highway and the amount of lemons that are imported to the US from Mexico. And you can see the more you import from Mexico, the less people die on the highway. And what you can see here is that there is a very high correlation efficient computed. The R squared, the explained variance, is 0.97. So that's very, very high. So people could look at this and think, wow, there is this relationship. Maybe if we uh, want to lower the number of people who die on the highway, we just need to import more lemons from Mexico. But of course, that's a pretty stupid idea. And there's no real relationship here. Still, you can compute that for a lot of different things. Here's another example that I think is quite funny. So here we have in blue the divorce rate in the US state Maine per 10,000 people. And we have the amount of margarine that is consumed. And you can see they're very, very closely related. Another example is the consumption of mozzarella cheese and the number of civil engineering doctorates that is awarded. But I don't think if we start eating more mozzarella cheese, if we start eating more pizza, we will see more people with a doctorate in civil engineering. So there's not really a causation. One thing is not causing the other, but there is a correlation. And I'm showing you this to really give you a feeling of how important it is to really question what we can learn from the data and what we can't. Here's a XKCD comic that's also kind of making fun of this complexity. So the person says, I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, now I don't. And the other person says, well, it sounds like the class helped. And the other one says, well, maybe. And of course, the statistics class will definitely help you better understand this relationship between correlation and causation. But it's really important to take away that correlation does not imply causation. It's the first step is what you need, right? It's like the necessary condition, but it's not enough. And it's only a starting point. I told you before that it's very important to look at these five number statistics to consider the mean. And again, that was the sum of the values divided by the count of non-missing observations. And the median, that's the number exactly in the middle if you look at all the data that you have. Look at the minimum and the maximum. 
and the different quartiles to see where the majority of your data points is. But I have a nice counter example now to also show you the limitations of that approach. And again, it doesn't mean that you should not look at it, but it means that you become aware of the limitations of your methods. And that's what science is all about. So here's a data set. It's the so-called Escombis Quartet. And you can pause the video and have a look at the data set and think about what they have in common, think about how they're different, and think about what they could represent. Now, after you looked at this, I'm going to present you the statistics that I thought are a really good starting point to understand your data. And what you find is that they all share the same statistics. They all have the same mean. They all have the same sample variance. Uh, and there's also the same correlation between the x and the y here. It has the same value up to three decimal points. And if you fit a linear regression, you get the exactly same uh, decision boundary for the linear regression as well. So this is an important indication that looking at just the numbers, looking at just the aggregate statistics is not enough. It does not mean that you should not use the five number summaries. They're a very good starting point, but combine them with histogram graphs, combine them with line charts, with box and whisker plots, with scatter plots, and in combination, that will give you a much better and much more holistic overview of the data that you have. And this is just a quick recap from the tutorial on the Titanic data. So it's always a very good starting point when doing this exploratory data analysis to look into the data, to look at individual instances in your data, to get a bit of a feeling of what you're actually dealing with here. So use a command like head to look at the first n instances um, and compute these five number statistics like the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, but also, and that's really important, compute the histogram. You can see here that if you use pandas, you have a dot hist function on your data frames, and here you get an overview of all the different columns in your data. You can also take individual value counts, see how often the biological sex is male or female, and I think that's a very, very good starting point. But now we're also going to think a bit beyond that and to think of other ways of visualizing your data. So let's consider a bit of theory. So how would we define visualization? So we use this definition from Tufte, who wrote one of the most important books in visualization. And for him, visualization is data communicated visually with clarity, precision, and efficiency. So the role of visualization is to communicate data meaning through stories. And I'd like to show you this famous example. Maybe you have already seen it, but it's one of the most famous, but also one of the earliest data visualizations there is. And it basically shows Napoleon in Russia. So Napoleon gathered this massive army of more than 400,000 people to attack Russia in June 1812. So the Russian troops, they kept retreating as Napoleon's troops moved forward and they burned everything they passed. So they ensured that the French forces could not take anything from the environment. And this whole terrible war is visualized in just this one visualization. So what we have here is the geography. We have the path that people travel going from Paris to Moscow. Then we have the temperature and we have the losses of the army. So the light path is the way to Moscow and the black path is the way back. And you can see how the number of people that were actually part of the army decreased significantly. So this is just to show you that with visualization, you can communicate a lot of really important insights in a very straightforward way. Another famous example is from Hans Rusling, uh, who has a company called Gapminder. And what we see here is the income per person, that's the GDP per capita, and the life expectancy of a person, and how they're related 
over time and how they increased. And you can also see the population of the country based on the size of the circle. So let's replay this. You can see that there's definitely a relationship between how much income per person you have in a country and how high your life expectancy is. And this is, so this is the first insight that the data provides, but this now can also enable you to find the countries that are outliers, that are special. And so this is one visualization that combines a lot of information into just one interactive piece. And this can help the viewer to interpret the data in a very, very different way. So imagine you have this as an Excel sheet. You have more than 190 countries and more than 200 years, and you have the life expectancy, the income per person, and the size of the country, and the geopolitical association of the country. That's a lot of data, but here we narrow it down and we make it accessible in a very nice way. Unfortunately, this is not a course on visualization per se, but nevertheless, I'd like to recommend you some books. We already saw the definition by uh, Edward Tufte, and his book is called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. But all these other books have different takes on visualization that might be helpful. Now I'd like to show you one of the information visualizations that I did as a student, and it's about Bremen and where the taxes of Bremen actually go to. So this is work I did together with Julian Hestenheide, and we looked at the commuters in Bremen and where they paid their taxes. So we have Bremen here, and they all go to work in Bremen, but then they go at night to the different parts of Lower Saxony where they pay the taxes. And they do this every day. So we try to visualize the money with these little coins, and you can see it's increasing um, step by step, and you can basically see where the people live and where the money is paid. Now, I found this really nice visualization by Dark House Analytics that is basically giving you a bit of a design input on how to make a table more readable. So this is what we start with. And let's review the different changes made to this table to make it more readable. So they start with removing the colors and the grid lines, as well as the fields and the borders. So they basically make everything plain. And they build lines here, right? You have clear lines that help your eye to trace the data. And you try to resize the columns to fit the data and you add some more white space. You also want consistent precision, but not too much precision. And, and this is really important. You try to remove uh, repetition. And then you can add some emphasis. So here their credo is, Less is more. And yeah, we can review this again, right? Uh, so this is much, much easier to read, even though it's the exact same data. We didn't change anything about the data. We just followed some very, very simple rules to make this more digestible, to make this easier to understand for people. And again, correlations are not bad. Correlations are a great tool to see whether there's a linear relationship both positive and negative between different data. So it's useful to look at it. I showed you already how to compute it. There's this dot core in pandas. So you can get the correlations. And I also showed you that it's better if you visualize this. Uh, but what I'd like to highlight here is that this can be also quite useful to check whether your model is relying on only one source of information. So you could have a situation where half of your features are related to age, so that age is dominating the prediction, so that the system doesn't properly generalize because it's just too much information on age. So with this tool, with looking at how the features are related, you could spot that and then just focus on one source of information related to age, so that you have a diverse pool of information that the model can then leverage to actually make good generalizable decisions. I already also told you uh, about this issue of imputation, right? Now we're working a lot with data sets 
that are meant for teaching. So you can just use them right away. Uh, for instance, the Boston housing data set. But once you start using real world data, the whole issue of imputation um, is becoming increasingly more important. And in a way, I can't really give you an easy answer here. I just can tell you to be sensitive to this issue and to think about it. I had this example here where, for instance, for age, you could put in the mean age of people, but that would be a terrible idea if especially young people were missing because then you would greatly overestimate their age. So you really need to think about this problem and to use additional information to make the imputation in a way. Or in the worst case, you have to drop that data. You have to drop these different instances from your model. We already learned about this train test split. Um, and I told you that it's really important to measure our generalization capabilities. I'd also invite you to think a bit more about what this means. So what we did so far is we took our data set and then we randomly chose 80% of the data to train the model and then we had 20% of the data to test the model. And I'd like you to pause the video and to think a bit about the risks that this entails. So what could go wrong? So please pause it now. And now I'm going to provide you the answer. Just think about the example of the cars that we had. Right? We had this list and there was like a lot of terrible cars and very, very few good cars. So we could end up in a situation where we train our model on exclusively terrible cars and then we're very bad at making predictions when we feed in the very good cars or vice versa. So just randomly selecting the data might be problematic. And this is in a way due to class imbalances. Right? If we have very, very many cars of a particular cars, they might both dominate our training or our testing, and we don't want that. One mitigation is the so-called stratification. In statistics, a strata is a non-overlapping group. And what we try to do is to perform the so-called stratified sampling, which means that we want to have a proportional random sample per strata. And we still want random parts for the training and random parts for the testing, but we want this to be proportional to the different groups that we have in our data. So here's a visualization that tries to show you what this means. So if we would select randomly here, we might end up in a situation with four red squares. And the stratification makes sure that we have enough of the blue ones, enough of the green ones, and enough of the red ones, so that our model can actually get to know all the different types of targets that we want to feed into the model. So another problem that we have is that we're training our model and then we're changing some things about the model. We're training it again, we're changing some things. So not only have, do we have this risk of the model overfitting on the data, but there's also a risk of us overfitting on the data, making modeling decisions so that we're very, very good on this particular subset of data, but losing our generalization capabilities for real world data. And one thing to mitigate this is to not only have a train test split, but to have a train validation test split. So for the majority of you working with your data, you would only use your training data and your validation data, and you would use that to tune your hyperparameters, to make decisions about the model, to decide whether to use TFIDF or not, to decide whether or not to remove stop words, and then only at the very, very end for your report, you would use another part of your data to then really measure the generalization capabilities. I think it's highly advantageous if you do this. It's really, really important. Um, so please consider not only doing a train test split, but also the train validation test split. So you take the entire data and you subdivide it into three parts. Another thing that you should be doing when evaluating your model is to perform a so-called k-fold cross-validation, which means that rather than having just one test train split or well train split, you use many. And in this context, each split is a so-called fold. So that's why it's a k-fold cross-validation. 
if it's a five-fold cross-validation, we subdivide our data into five parts, and then we always use four parts of that randomly selected data to train the model and one part to test the model. And then we have a very, very good idea about the generalization capabilities of our model. Because we don't want a situation where we have very good training accuracy, but very poor testing accuracy. Because testing is what it's all about, right? We want to make predictions about the future. We don't just want to learn our data by heart. So fortunately, implementing this in scikit-learn is comparatively easy. We have the so-called crossfire score function. And what this function does is it takes a classifier and it takes your x and your y. And then you can specify how many cross-validation splits you actually want to do. Here we have a three-fold cross-validation on a comparatively small data set. That was the data set with flowers. And we compare these different scores. And what you can see is that we have quite a range here. So one of the models, one of the folds was 92% accurate, whereas one was 96% accurate. So we would then just basically take the average of that. A uh, three-fold cross-validation makes sense with very small data sets like the iris data, but in practice, consider doing a 10-fold cross-validation. And it's good practice to report the mean as well as the standard deviation and the median, but you can also point out the minimum as well as the maximum so that you can get a feeling what the range of accuracy, what the range of precision, what the range of recall of your model is. So I would highly encourage you to do this K-fold cross-validation, but I'd also like you to have heard about some other types of cross-validation. If you have very, very limited data, let's say you're working on the classification of a particular virus and you only have 50 data points, then you could use the so-called leave one out cross-validation. And that means that you use a single data point for the test set. But that can be very time consuming. So if you have many, many data points, of course, that means training many, many models and then always doing the cross-validation. But especially in the early papers in medicine, you can see this approach being applied. Another approach that you could be using is the so-called shuffle split cross-validation, which means that before each split, you randomly shuffle the data set. So with k for cross-validation, we shuffle it once and then we subdivide it into, let's say, eight parts or ten parts. And here, for each of the different runs, we shuffle the data set separately. And finally, we already talked about the idea of the hyperparameters. So in practice, when doing this exploratory data analysis, what you want to do is to find the optimal hyperparameters. Um, and that, of course, poses the question of how to determine these hyperparameters. The simple approach is really to just have a for loop with different values, different gamma values, different k's, different c, and then you loop through them and you compute a model and then you do cross-validation and you see which one actually performs the best. That's simple and really computing heavy, but unfortunately it's almost the best there is. Because a good approach for this is still open research and I invite everybody to think of clever ways of doing this. There are some Bayesian approaches, but I think there's still a lot that can be improved here to find better models. And that's my input on the topic of exploratory data analysis. I'm also going to provide you with a more practical view in the next video. Uh, and I hope in combination that these things will help you to come up with a really nice project 